welcome to a new episode of the Dive into Reiki podcast today with my lovely guest, um, Bronwyn Logan. Hello. Hi, <laughs> welcome. So let me give everyone a little bit of your background. Based in Australia, Bronwyn is a Reiki author, teacher, and the co-founder of the International House of Reiki and the Shibumi International Reiki Association. Due to her research into the Japanese aspect of the system of Reiki since the early 2000s, along with her writing and teachings, Bronwyn has been a major influence on in how the system is taught and practiced around the world. Her books, co-written with Franz Stine, include the Reiki source book, the Japanese art of Reiki, AZ of Reiki Pocketbook, Reiki Techniques, Card Deck, and New Reiki Treatment. Brownlin has also recorded the double CD, Reiki Meditation for Self-Healing and Reiki Relaxation, which sounds true, which I own and love. And I'm so grateful uh, you accepted this invitation and that we all get a chance to know you better because I feel like, I don't know if you, because you're far away in Australia, but we never see that other side of the International House of Reiki. So welcome again. Thank you. Perfect. Nice to be here. <laughs> I love the fact that you are like on opposite. I know like it's very normal now with Zoom, but I still love the fact that it's, morning, <laughs> it's Friday over there and it's Thursday evening here. So yeah. I would love to start a little bit uh, with the same question I start with everyone. What was your initial contact with Reiki the first time you came across this modality and a little bit of yeah. your journey? Okay. Uh, yeah, well, I would have been I don't, early, early 20s. And uh, I do remember hearing about it then and thinking, what is this thing? And I do remember some strange experience of when I lived in Australia and I went to some strange person's house and they made me fill in all these forms and and I don't actually have, I have no idea what that was, but I do remember that they were calling it Reiki. So I don't know what that was. <laughs> and that sort of was, so I, I sort of went away from that thinking, huh, okay, and I left it, right? And then a couple of years later, when I was living in Holland, my best friend came over to visit and she, um, she had studied Reiki. So she was um, doing Reiki on me all the time and, and it was really lovely. And that was, that was a really nice introduction actually. So um, I was, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a nice thing to do. And at that time in my life, I was, uh, I, I was trying to find out more about different sort of practices. So I was taking, you know, different meditation classes and just doing things to try to find out what, what might you know make me feel uh, better in myself and um, stronger and happier? Yeah, so. <laughs> I love that. Like I, I love how like a lot of people actually come across Reiki uh, through friends, right? Especially yeah. in the beginning when there wasn't a lot of like professional practitioners, right? So what made you, how did you say, okay, I, I go from, I love receiving Reiki from my friend to this is the practice that is going to, in a way, define your life because. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, well, I, I was living in Holland and um, with Franz and we went to India and, oh, well, we sold everything up and went to India. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't a holiday and uh yeah we were going to travel through asia but he had um very bad sciatica which he'd had for a number of years so we were looking for something because we were backpacking you know that's really hard to actually carry a backpack when you're in pain so we were looking for something that could help with that and we tried all different sorts of things and met different sorts of people and well, you know india is an amazingly different country you know there are lots of different modalities and you know local indigenous things and it was that was very interesting and then we went uh we went down to the south of India where um there's a lot of Ayurveda and uh so that's the like the um I, I don't know how you would say that. That is, that's like a traditional Indian healing system for people who don't know. And uh, there 
we also oh, uh, well we we booked Franz into a, uh, a a little local place to have a treatment done um, an Ayurvedic treatment which is said to be very good for sciatica so um, we stayed there for a number of weeks while he was sort of going backwards and forwards and having this treatment in the jungle and um, at the same time we were looking at yeah, healing modalities. And we came across a book. Um, there was a book by Paula Horan, actually, who uh, I think she's American and she lives in India or lived in India at that time. And she had published a book about the system of Reiki. And it was a, you know, a very um, a, a simple uh, beginner's book. So that was really great. And um, I remember sitting there like on the edge of the bed, you know, sort of uh, in, in the little room, you know, that you have in a, in a backpackers, sort of like putting hands, sort of like, you know, trying to do <laughs> this thing and not having any idea what I was doing, uh, but very curious. So um, then, uh, so we thought that that would be an interesting practice to learn. And when we went to Nepal, we came across a, an Englishman who lived there and he was teaching the system of Reiki. So uh, we were there for a number of months and um, studied through him. So yeah, that was, I mean, the, the type of, you know, what he was teaching was a little bit all over the place, to be honest, yeah. Um, but it sort of didn't matter in one way. Like I remember thinking I did Reiki one and thought, oh, wow, this is amazing. You know, truly amazing. And then I did Reiki two and I was just like, oh, you know, this is something that, you know, could be like you were saying before, like a defining moment. It's something that really, that it, it's something that is going to change everything, or how I'm going to do things in life because at the, I was very fortunate at that time in my life that I didn't have to, I didn't have a job to go to. I didn't have to do anything, you know, to uh, be there for other people or, you know, do anything except, you know, really look at myself and, and see what was happening with me and, and, and reach out to anything that could help me. So, uh, yeah, we then went on and did Reiki 3 there. So that was... Yeah, it was really great, and um, it was it was sort of a bit mind blowing this idea that that we could teach this, and um, so not long after being in Nepal, we went to Darjeeling in the Indian Himalaya, and we rented a house there, right on the very top of Darjeeling, which we called Reiki House, and um, we started doing treatments and teaching people. So that was sort of, you know, it was definitely not my intention. And in fact, you know, the reason why I went to India first was because I thought the food was really great. I love Indian food. So, you know, it was a bit like that's that was the main reason. And and then once I got there, it's a bit of an addiction, India. I think, you know, people who really like it, you know, it just becomes it's so it's such a fascinating place and then you know I thought oh you know we'd be moving on to Thailand and you know wherever else in Southeast Asia uh, but that didn't happen so I ended up being in India for two years at that point yeah I, I love hope like a lot of people go to India like yoga journey or spiritual journey you went for food and you ended up <laughs> yeah. with a spiritual practice right and also yeah. like a bunch of European actually learn the Japanese practice in India. I, I I just find like the roads that take us to our destiny are really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how how did that interest suddenly you were practicing and suddenly how did you realize there is more to Reiki than as you say a little bit all over the place? <laughs> yeah, I mean when when I life. yeah so when I first studied. Um, the guy sort of had all these little bits of photocopies of this and that, you know, it was all in, I mean, this was, uh, you know, in the late 1990s and, you know, we didn't really have computers. I actually did get a computer at that, when I started teaching the system of Reiki, I got a computer and set up my first ever website, which was very exciting. Oh my you God. Know? Yeah, I know. <laughs> like, you know, this long scrolly page. Uh, but, you know, what he gave us was, you know, 
bits, I guess, photocopied out of books or things like that. And it was from different books and it was, I was just like, how does this all fit together? You know, I didn't have much of an idea. And then the idea that you, you know, I wanted to teach people and how do you teach something that you're, you know that there's something really amazing there, but you're not quite sure how to put it all together. Yeah. And uh, so, um, yeah, we started, well, actually, we did ask a lot of questions of that teacher. And in the end, he told us not to contact him anymore. So, <laughs> I, I <have> no <laughs> Also, I think he, he, yeah. he just didn't know the answers, right? So I, I have the same like, theory, yeah. Hey? I have the same theory to the teacher. I called and hung up on me oh. as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's sort of, that's a, that's a difficult situation, but it's a really great learning lesson, isn't it? You know? So it's like, don't be like that. Yeah. <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. So um, I don't, I've never said to anyone, I can't answer something. Even if I don't know the answer, I'll go away and work it out, right? So um, anyway, uh, what did we do? So yeah, well, we came back to Australia because I was pregnant. So we came back to Australia where my mum lives and um, uh, continued to, you know, uh, build a, uh, a business here. I actually... When we came back to Australia, I did, I had already done a teaching English as uh, for foreign, as a foreign language um, course in England and had done a little teaching and I'd done a little teaching actually before I left Australia as well. Um, I used to teach, well, I, I used to, I studied performing arts, so I used to teach performing arts as well. And then, uh, so we came back to Australia and um, I did a business course. So that was really great because that sort of um, helped because I think a lot of the problems that people who do the system of Reiki, you know, who are practicing the system of Reiki and want to start a business, they may not have those skills. And, you know, it's another important part of that. Yep. Guilty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you learn, right? You're yeah. learning. Look at this, you know, so, you know, great ideas. You know, so um, that was included things like marketing and, you know, just how to do finances and all those sorts of things. So, you know, just making your mind tick over in a different way and think about how you can best do this. And so that was really interesting. And actually within probably a year of that, I also did a teaching, teaching um, teacher training and assessment course here as well in Australia. So um, just to get more teaching skills up. And I think that's really important too. Another thing that people, you know, when they're teaching the system of Reiki, they just don't have the skills for teaching. So they're not really sure, you know, maybe they might be approaching things from, a, from an angle that might not work for their students or whatever. So, you know, finding different ways of how people learn and what's the best thing for them and that really helped me in creating you know like the the uh the key campus our student website so that you know all all the aspects of that and the the classes in that you know that really helped with all of that um and just while i'm talking about those things also doing you know like a basic counseling um skills course you don't have to be a counsellor because it's not about being a counsellor, but, you know, knowing how to be with someone if they're really upset, you know, or, or whatever, I think is a really helpful thing. Um, how to, if someone comes in the door and, you know, they're not feeling great, you know, what do you say to them? You know, just really basic, simple things like that, I think are really helpful for people as well. So, um, and first aid would be the other one that I would recommend that people have. Actually, I just saw in Australia that um, our treasurer for New South Wales, the state that I'm in, was walking down the street and um, someone uh, had a fit in front of him and collapsed and he had his first aid and he helped that person immediately and how everyone was like, wow, that's fantastic. Um, you know, I think for anybody, it's a really good thing to have that you can help people who are in need. And as a Reiki practitioner, you just never know what's going to happen. So that's a, something of benefit too, right? No, and, and I think it's, 
it's important because I think most of us, like when we go professional, we really struggle. And then there is this opinion that the energy is intelligent and it does everything, but you still, there is a human interaction beyond what you may think of that statement Absolutely. or not. There is yeah. a human interaction about how we communicate, how we yeah. hold the space, like non, even like before, after the session, how, what we say about the session, or as you say, if someone gets there, or like in my case, I remember one person started like getting naked, like New York is like, how do you react? Like when someone gets naked and they're not supposed to, right? So those skills and then <laughs> the base, and those are the human skills. So the more we learn, the easier it becomes because it's a business already not very easy, right? It's very subjective. Some people feel it, some don't. So the more well-rounded we are, I think it makes it easier, but also it makes us more accountable. You know, again, going back to the idea, oh, the energy does everything, but you need to be accountable for the way you serve as a practitioner, right? Absolutely. So I, love I mean, that. Yeah. as we're speaking, the energy is still flowing and 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 intelligent, right? You know, but you know, there are still other aspects to this existence, and um, you know, they are the practical aspects, um, which I think will you know make a big difference. And in fact, you know, they're the things that really set you know the International House of Reiki up to be the International House of Reiki, and. If I look even at um, like the, the name, the International House of Reiki, uh, I mean, I would never have called our business the International House of Reiki. You know, we were teaching out of our spare bedroom, you know, with a baby in the other room, right, when, when we started in Australia. But when I did the business course, they made me choose a name. And um, the names that I wanted, I couldn't have. And so... <laughs> So it actually automatically said, this is, this is what we recommend that you should use because no one's got this name, right? And I went, oh, okay, whatever. <laughs> and I thought, well, France is from Holland. I'm from Australia. And we'd studied in, in India and Nepal, in Nepal and taught in India. Oh, well, that'll do, you know. <laughs> and look at what it became, right? I know, it's funny, isn't it? But in a way, we were international, I guess. So anyway. Yeah. But, but back to you. Imagine that you will teach classes all over the world, and now with Zoom yeah. e campus. So it is. It almost like the name. You grew into the name. It's a beautiful thing. In, in a way, but you know, I think that also I've always had quite uh, an open sort of uh, feeling with with this. I must say. So it's like if it's. I've always had like you know, if you want to do something, you do it to the best that you can possibly do it. Right. So. That was sort of goes back to your question that you were asking before about, um, you know, the development sort of idea of things. Um, so we, uh, in, in Australia, you know, setting up a business and um, trying to work out what the hell we were teaching because, you know, it's all well and good. I did actually find that that year of teaching in Darjeeling was a bit like a, um, a what do you call that when you, internment no that's not the right word is it you know you know like when you when you when you're learning something basically oh, like, yeah, even though, like an sorry? internship that sort of thing sort of internship that's it so that, that sort of thing yeah 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 so you know that sort of feeling and uh so setting 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 up the idea so you know you're thinking i mean all all that i would do in my week was, you know, get up, teach, practice, because we go out and do treatments uh, on local people um, or they would come to us. And, you know, every couple of days we were teaching people who were traveling through. Um, so it was a mixture of, you know, local people and travelers that we were sort of working with, but it was constant, you know, and we'd, it was lovely. We, in this house that we lived in this, um, we had a lady who would come and um, make us breakfast because she she was actually meant to be the cleaner, but she didn't like cleaning, so she'd make the breakfast. <laughs> and um, that was really lovely and delicious. It was beautiful. And uh, all I can think of when I think of that is like pumpkin and tamarind and homemade rotis. Oh, my God, so beautiful. And then, you know, and then we'd work, go out for lunch, come back, work, go out for dinner, 
because we didn't really have a kitchen. And, um, and then in the evening I'd write and it was just like heavenly. It was so, so non-stressful and you could just focus completely on what it is that you want to do. And so it was a really great experience before moving back into the big world of having to, you know, earn a buck and, you know, that sort of thing. So, and have a baby. So, uh, yeah, back in Australia, when we got here, then we started researching more. The internet was taking off. That was amazing. So, you know, we started contacting people all around the world and saying, you know, what, 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 what manuals do you use? You know, what do you teach? Who did you study with? And started collecting folder upon folder of information and putting that all together. And then in 2001, we went to Japan and, uh, uh, you know, had worked out to meet different teachers that were um, living there. And uh, which was great to make those contacts and find out more in information, you know, so we met, you know, um, Chiyoko Yamaguchi, who's no longer with us. Um, and, you know, there was a, uh, well, Hyakuten Inamoto, you know, Pure Land Monk, he, he took us around and um, we met another um, teacher who was from the Gakkai. Um, so we, you know, different people and it was excellent, an excellent way of, you know, just trying to ground ourselves a little bit more and, what was happening in Japan or had happened in Japan, yeah. So there wasn't, in one way, there wasn't that much happening in Japan at the time. Um, and I noticed that a lot of the Japanese people were very much interested in what we were doing in the West. So they were, you know, into things like dolphin reiki and, you know, things like that. <laughs> and I was like, this is really weird, you know, so like, we want to know what the worst, what what you know people are doing in Japan, and Japan wants to know you know what the what what's been happening over in the West. So, yeah, that was an interesting sort of experience. Like but you have sushi every day. You want a burger every so often, right? <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so uh, anyway, we got all this information, put it together, and um, I spent I don't know. I guess, at least a year writing the Reiki source book. But the thing was that I met this guy who was a, um, ran a bookstore here and he'd written something like 55 books and it was a spiritual bookstore. And, you know, I don't even know how we got to talk, but anyway, we were talking, ended up going out um, and meet, having a meeting and, you know, saying this is the idea for the book and he's like if you know what it is you want to write it's going to happen and I said okay and he said actually I've got a publisher in the UK who you know would be more than happy to have a look at it why don't you give it to me and I'll send it through and so he said write a couple of chapters send it through and I did and um got got a publishing contract so it was like oh that was too easy. So it was really easy. You know how like sometimes things are easy. And uh, so that was really lovely. And, but then, and the good thing was that I had a date to have it finished by. So all that information I had to collate and go through and, you know, make sense of, and that was the Reiki source book. So yeah, it was, I was so thrilled about that. And, you know, it was, a great thing to have put together because it expressed the confusion that, you know, I'd had when I started learning and how if, I mean, it's not a book for a beginner, but it's if you were a teacher that you could look into this book and go, so I was taught this technique. Where does that technique come from? Yeah. yeah. Or, you know, this is the lineage that I'm in what does that mean? You know, who, what, you know, who says what, where, what was introduced at what point in that lineage? And uh, because there was a lot of confusion around what the system of Reiki was at that time. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think that writing that book and then the Japanese art of Reiki has really helped to clarify for a lot of people, you know, what the system is, what, 
what it's made up of, you know, so writing those books, you know, the idea that there's a certain number of elements that you have to practice to be able to say that you're actually working with the system of Reiki. Because what I found incredibly frustrating <laughs> was that people would go, oh yeah, I do Reiki. Yeah, I do Reiki. And I'm thinking, what do they mean I do Reiki? You know, like I do spiritual energy. I don't understand that. I mean, you know, we're spiritual beings. Yes, we're also physical beings. I, I mean, I don't know. It was just very confusing. So if someone says they do Reiki, does that mean they actually studied a course or or did someone say, my grandmother told me how to, you know, do something, yeah. right? Um, which I don't invalidate at all, but it may not be the system of Reiki is all I'm saying, right? You know? Mm, and and then, yeah, I think that yeah. is a great confusion. Like hands-on yeah. healing is a human right and energy is like something, but Reiki is a system to harness that. It's not yeah. the energy per se. And I think that's where people get a little bit all over the place. As you say, my grandma had the gift and I have it. Yeah. So, you know, it's a bit like saying that you do Tai Chi or something. Yeah. Now, Tai Chi, you know, it's working with energy and moving. Well, if I work with energy and moving, do I do Tai Chi? No, I need to <laughs> actually learn the practices, right? Yes. So... Um, anyway, so that was, um, you know, and then, um, there are some other books as well, you know, your Reiki treatment, um, which the publisher asked us to write. Um, and, um, yeah, so that was good. And yeah. No, no, no. I was just going to say, I, I said in this many times, like I have a before and after my Reiki practice and it was the Japanese art of Reiki. I, I did treatments, I did everything. I things didn't make sense, like at a truly deep level until I read that book. So for me, as you say, like understanding the different elements of it and then yeah. really bringing that more meditation aspect of the practice, less yeah. magical, more human, like it made it human approachable versus something very magical that I couldn't control or do anything, right? And I, I still don't do, I hold the space, but what I can control is my practice, right? Yeah. I can, I, as I say, like I can be accountable for practicing every day for yeah. never teaching or doing a session if I'm not, if I haven't practiced and I don't know what I'm doing. So that's yeah. what I really like. It just, it did a click in my head. Yeah. Yeah, I think that refining the idea of what all these bits and pieces are, okay, you know, because even when when I studied in Nepal with the English guy, you know, there were meditations, right? But they weren't the same meditations, but they were meditations because I think that people realize that if you're going to do a spiritual practice, there is some level of meditative practice in that. Yes. Yeah? And um, it's just what is that is another question again. But... Uh, yeah, I do remember that um, when I first came to uh, back to Australia at that time, that I was talking to another Reiki teacher and uh, she was going to me, oh, no, 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 there's no breathing practices in the system of Reiki. I teach the real, you know, you know, you sort of, you have to go through that experience. I went through that experience anyway of having to try to work out what was and wasn't um real for me you know like talking to these two to different people and there were a lot of people you know who most of the people that you would talk to had studied through western you know practices through Hawaii Takata who you know had had taught from Hawaii and it had come down from there and they a lot of them had different ideas so trying to <sighs> discuss this I thought was you know incredibly difficult and that also helped to write because you're trying to refine what you're understanding from what you've been discovering and um, putting that together so you know I mean you know the, the the idea that breathing practices 
I mean, I think once again, you know, we're just saying meditative practices, but breathing practices also are a natural part of, I think, almost all spiritual practices, you know, but I think the problem there was that in the West, people were very much focused on hands on healing, which is sort of what you were saying before, I think. Yeah. 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 So it was just trying to bring people not to say that it's not that, you know, that it didn't exist. Yes, it does exist. And we definitely do one of the elements of the system of Reiki is working with your hands, right? But uh, it's just one of the aspects. It's not the aspect. And um, the idea that the precepts, I mean, we were taught the precepts right way back in the beginning, but it was really just, it was not discussed and not really thought about. And, you know, if we think about it now, we can see that the precepts are actually, of the five elements, the precepts are the one that these other four elements are saying, um, if you work with, with us, then you'll be this. So it's the more important part, right? If there is a more important part, right? So um, it's really the precepts, because if we can be those precepts, then we can be uh, then we are Reiki, you know, then we are, we, we discover ourself, we discover our true self, we discover uh, what it means to be, you know, what ultimately we would call enlightened. Yeah. And even like, if we don't make it that far, you know, like, for me, like, it makes it so much more approachable when I meet people and Again, I was mentioning to you before, I teach a lot of corporate meditations and people who may not be open to a spiritual yeah. practice towards enlightenment. But when I say to you, like, this is just meant to live your life with less anger and worry and feel yeah. more compassionate to yourself and more grateful, that's it. Like, I saw, like, sometimes we struggle to explain what Reiki practice is. Yeah. And it's in, the, it's in the precepts. Like, yeah. who doesn't want to live their life with less anger and worry? Sometimes they think it's the other people's worry and anger because they don't believe in them, but it's still a great way to just explain the system in a very human, practical, yeah. like you benefit from this everyday way. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. No, that's that's beautiful, you know. And I, I, for me, the system of Reiki is an incredibly simple system. Yeah, it's it's not it's not bells and whistles. And I'm very much, you know, no rules Reiki is what I often say. I, you know, I, I, of course there is a foundation and a structure. Hey, yes, explain that the exists. rules Reiki because it can go a little rogue there. Uh, <laughs> you know, when we start making rules, it's all, it's all in the head. It's all this yeah. rational, you know, oh, what I think, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. letting that go. Yeah. Perfect. I love that. And I actually, I know, like, I wanted to talk a little bit about the meditation and, and your CDs and guided meditation as well, right? Yeah, so yeah. for me, for example, um, I'm a little bit thick-headed when it comes to spiritual practices and meditation, right? So when they used to teach them, I struggled to understand them. So your guided meditation were very clear. Like, for example, Nenta Suho, I could never practice that until I really heard it. And then in yeah. my case I translate them to drawing because I'm visual but but your explanations were very clear right so a lot of us like in the Reiki community we create guided meditations so what are some of like the do's and also the like stay away from when it comes to guided meditations uh, for Reiki yeah I mean I think a lot of people love guided meditation because it helps their brain like if to to latch on to something I mean you know the whole, you know, the Zen thing where you would sit for hours and do, and just, there's That's nothing, right? Very incredibly actually. hard. Yeah, it's so it's hard. So right? nice. <laughs> and, and in our society, people, you know, we are more intellectually based. We are too top heavy, right? But then finding a way to help work with that top heaviness, guided meditation will help with that, right? So, uh some of the do's of guided meditation i guess are if you're going to do it i always say to people record yourself first you know when you're 
trying to get good at it, right? Record yourself first and then listen back. And does it make any sense what you just said? <laughs> because, you know, you might forget, you know, to tell people to, I don't know, something simple like just to close their eyes or whatever, right? Um, you might not think about what they're doing with their hands, right? So, um, and people are thinking, oh, so instead of them meditating, they're thinking about, am I meant to be doing this or am I meant to be doing that, right? They, they don't know what they're meant to be doing. So physically really helping people move into the space and uh, knowing where they are. It's a bit like, I always say that with Reiki treatments as well, that what you want is the person to be really, really comfortable because the more comfortable that someone is, the less that they're going to, um, their mind is gonna be less active. If they're uncomfortable, then their mind's gonna be going, should I, should I, what are they gonna do now? You know, is this, you know, and there's just all this stuff going on in their heads. So we don't want that. What we really want is for them to be able to let go and to be that. in the space, you know? And so, making someone comfortable in whatever way that is, I think that's really important. I mean, there's lots of do's and don'ts, but that that's, for example, telling them how long the meditation is gonna be, you know, because they might think when you start, oh, you know, it's gonna be five minutes, or they might think, oh my God, do I have to sit here for an hour? You know, so yeah, giving them, giving them just guidelines, really supporting the person, thinking about the other person, you know, being empathetic, putting yourself in their position. I think it's a really basic fundamental thing to do. The other thing is, you know, we actually, when we're speaking and we do meditation, we're going into that space as well. So we need to be careful that we don't end up doing and, and it all just fades <laughs> away, right? <laughs> yeah, no, you know that, that yeah. we're so in it that we're in it in here, but we're just not, you know. So ensuring that you're actually still in the space with the students because it's very easy to go into your own practice. But as a teacher, you need to be in both spaces at once. And that, you know, is a little bit of a challenge, but it's something that you can practice and get better at. But even though it's great to be in that space, because then we are, as you were saying, holding that space, we also need to, um, you know, um, be able, so we need to be, we need to be able to feel that space. So feel the practice as, as we're doing it, but we need to also have that sense of knowing that we're here and being aware of what's going on for the students. Because once again, you don't know what's going to happen. And if students can respond in different ways and someone might, you know, respond in a way that for them might not be, uh, they might be shocked by what's happening or something like that. And you need to be aware if that's happening in the group and, and if you need to be there for someone. I think that's a fantastic piece of advice for meditation, but also for practicing attunements and yeah, yeah. offering sessions, right? Because a lot of times when I, I see when I'm teaching people who are practicing, especially when you have little experience, you go on the ride with your client, like, whoa, look at this emotion, right? <laughs> or we're going into an attunement, it's like, wow, that was an amazing attunement versus yeah. being still centered and being there for your student or your client. So I, I love that you mentioned that and I will take the freedom to extend it to everything we do as teachers or practitioners. I think it's so important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, I think guided meditation really has a place for a lot of people in, especially, you know, like I said, because we, we do use our heads. And I know some people might think, oh, guided meditation. I think some people do think, oh, guided meditation, because, you know, it can be a little bit fluffy, right? Um, but it doesn't have to be. It can be very to the point and, and clear. Um, and like I said, if you sit through that meditation yourself, it'll teach you what, what works and what doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I love that. And I think for practitioners, it's a nice way to learn like traditional Japanese Reiki meditation, right? So if you don't have a teacher nearby who knows them, like those guided meditation, like yours and other teachers 
okay, this is how I do Choshin Kokio Ho. So yeah. after 10, 15 times, I can start my own practice. So I think it's also a beautiful gift. It can be like training wheels and then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when a voice is very nice, it becomes part of the practice, right? Like also it suits. So it's very beautiful. So I know that you also extend in slowly because you love animals. And from what I've heard, you've had a lot of animals. So you also practice and share the, the system of Reiki with animals um, because I want to be very careful how I phrase that. Uh, <laughs> so I would love to hear because everybody, you know, it's a, it's a theme that is coming more and more and more popular, like sharing Reiki with animals, a little bit of your approach and how did you develop your approach of, of Reiki with animals and a little bit what it is about? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I've always had animals in my life. Yeah. But, you know, I always see, see you know, humans also. <laughs> Sorry, so I've, I had, have, lots I was of, going to I've had lots of humans in my life too. Yeah. No. <laughs> I was going to say a New York joke. I've dated a lot of animals too, but that's a New York joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yes. <clears throat> but I'm talking about well mannered animals. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've always had some animals. I've always been. You know, I find in our society, the way that we talk to children is quite different to the way that we talk to adults. And yet, I think we're no different, whether we're children or adults. But with children, we, you know, there's so many beautiful picture books, you know, where the animal is, uh, the animal talks, the animal's the same as you and I'm talking about non-human animals yeah the non-human animals are the same as you and me you know and um I'm just trying to think of an example I don't know if you can think of an example there is that little there's actually a little rabbit what's that little cute little rabbit anyway there's there's so many animals that we teach children that that animal is the same as you it has you know feelings um, it can feel pain, it can be sad, it can be happy, you know, it can this and that. So same, same thing, yeah. Um, and children love that, you know, and they see that in animals. And I definitely, as a child, um, related to animals very, um, I, I just felt they were the same. I mean, even if I can still have this image of my dad with a cleaning out the pond and he had all these tadpoles in a um in in water in a bowl that he'd gotten out of the pond and he was going to throw them away and i'm like don't throw the pet you know you can't throw the tadpoles away and and this adult world not understanding that and yet this adult world had also come from this child world yeah so then when when children grow up the books that they were told where you know that the animals were like them, the books change. And the, it's like the, the rules change. And it's like, you know, I mean, how many kids have asked, oh, what is it that I'm eating? Yeah? And someone will say, well, that's pork. Yeah. What's pork? Well, you know that cute book about the pig, right? Winnie the Pooh, you know, all those sorts of things, you know, whatever, <laughs> I don't know, well, they're toys, aren't they? But you know what I'm saying, like, um, it's, it's like, well, you know that, that that's a pig you're eating. And then the child has to grow up and accept that, you know, this is what humans do. But we don't have to do that. And we, we can be, we can retain that connection that we, understand as children and that we don't mind allowing children to understand and that we almost you know we encourage children to understand that and then it's like our humanity and then we take our hum the humanity out of the humans you know and um I don't think I lost that humanity that particular humanity at any rate you know and uh I've always um really retained this this feeling of um 
you know, sharing my life, not not being the lord of, but sharing my life with with other animals, as I said, human, non-human, yeah, and feeling that that has been quite, it just feels very right to me. So, uh, yeah, I've had, oh, you know, from when I was a kid, I had dogs and cats and rabbits as I grew up. Um, and, you know, now I have a pig, <laughs> Flora, and, um, you know, <laughs> yeah, and, but, you know, I've got dogs and cats and I've got horses and I've had goats and, you know, I've got chickens and ducks and, yeah, so we all share this space together, yeah, and they all tell me what they want or what they don't want or whether things are good or not good. And, uh, you know, we share our life together. I, I believe that, you know, I mean, people love coming here because of the animals, because the animals actually share the space together as well. So I don't have like a, a pigsty. I don't know if you remember what that is. I do yeah. because my grandmother had a, a dairy farm with a pigsty. And it's like this little space with, you know, these big pigs inside it and they have to live in the mud and the shit and the food. And, um, you know, that's actually not how pigs in, in their natural existence live. So thinking about how animals live and how they're happiest and trying to make way for them to be able to experience that in the same way that I'm able to experience that. So you can say, you know, what, what does that have to do with the system of Reiki? <laughs> Well, you know, like I said, I'm a bit of a no rules Reiki person. I'm very much um, about uh, letting go and finding the truth in a situation and using the precepts to help me find those truths. And for me, the truths are that these animals need to live and exist, as I said, in uh, to the to the best, you know, that I would like them to live to the best way that they can possibly live, rather than me taking that away from them and telling them that they have to, you know, they can't go there, they can't do that. Instead, I allow them to go everywhere, but I create ways to make everybody safe. And um, as I said, to keep everybody happy. So it's like, it's more about living and experiencing life together rather than me trying to um, make them do or be something for me that's so beautiful yeah hmm. almost it's like a living embodiment of the practice versus just exactly. having them in the pig sty and offering hands-on healing to the pig for 10 minutes yeah you're not happy being there oh you know no <laughs> hmm yeah my pig is very chatty. Do they chat? <laughs> I've heard people say that they've never met a pig as chatty as my pig. She tells you the whole story. If there is something wrong, she is just like, <laughs> and she tells me this whole thing. And then she stops. Oh, and she's gotten it out of the system. Okay. That's that. You know, she's an absolutely amazing character. And it's wonderful for people to see an animal that they think of as food that we don't see because they actually have millions of them locked up in big sheds, yeah? And um, they, people just have no idea what a pig is actually like. So to meet a pig, you know, um, to experience that is, is really... Uh, meaningful I think for people it really gives them a something that is hidden away that's no longer hidden away so then they they actually need to have a think about things and think about would you eat your dog yeah <laughs> I will actually probably protect my dog Maximilian with my life yeah <laughs> It's like, yeah. is the, like actually the measure, like, do I love you or not? Do I love you more than Maximilian or less? Very few people pass that bar, probably two. Yeah, right. Yeah. 
So no, no, I think it's, it's lovely because again, sometimes we simplify what the Reiki of system and the relationship with animals are. And this is taking it from a whole different approach, which is very beautiful. Yeah. You know, like, especially like in places like yours, like in places like New York, there's also people helping with shelters as well, right? So yeah. it also like, but it's a great way, like if you live in a place where there is space, there is more, like here we, we learn <clears throat> to live on, like with the rats and be peaceful and not be scared. <laughs> I, I guess like the closest experience is I went for a picnic on the river, romantic picnic at night, and there were all these rats running around. And what we did was like to take our legs up and allow them to run. And they actually like, they understand because one of them, I call her like Rosa. She came to us and I said, no, 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 no. She looked at me like this and then she left. So <laughs> I guess, I know, but it's funny, but learning to accept that this is also their city and their living space, yeah like and allow we create it, yeah you know yeah. It, it's probably not such a romantic beautiful image but also probably a very yeah. realistic for millions of people but like they're not to be exterminated they're like living here next to the river like they're part of the city right and respecting the right to be here as well absolutely and you know <clears throat> what we do as far as how we um you know we create that environment okay for them and you know i can see in australia there's a lot of things happening in australia because as we it's it's a very natural environment but you know the people move more out into that nature and you know disturbing a lot of things and animals are responding in different ways i actually you know something this is just awful but i just something that talks about this is that in the middle of sit the city uh, in the North Shore, which is sort of more like a, a, a you know, a more expensive place to live. Um, in this one suburb, the people complained about the magpies. Do you know magpies? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Magpies, um, when it's nesting season and that they dive bomb them, you know how they, they try yeah. to get you? Yeah, okay, because they're protecting their nests. The people complained to the um, council and the council said, okay, well, if you don't want them, we'll exterminate them. <gasps> they went out and killed all the magpies. You know, this is, that's what I'm not for. So, you know, this is what I'm saying about, that's not finding ways to live in, you know, truthfully, yeah? yeah. There is no compassion. You know, yeah, I was and it's not hit on in sense of me, like no compassion to yourself and others, right? Because even to yourself, that's your environment that is going to suffer, and your future ecological balance is going to suffer. Yeah. Look, <clears throat> it's only like two weeks of the year that that happens. Yeah. And yeah. you know, there are there are things you can do to work with that. So you know, it's it's incredible that they that they actually did that. And that's you know, there's been a, a lot of uproar about it, and people are very upset. So I'm hoping that that won't happen again. But we can see in society how we just we're not really connected, you know, and we do these crazy things that, um, as you say, upset the balance. But the other thing that I was going to say about that is that. I totally believe that, you know, each of us, we create our own universe. We create this world, you know? So um, how I live, you know, you can say, oh, well, you know, you've got, you've done this, 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 and this. Yes, but I chose that, yeah? yeah. And uh, I chose to live like that and it's not always easy, right? So, you know, that there's, there's it, but it's life. And um, it is the life that I have chosen. So um, I think people need to think about that and that, you know, they, that they are the center of, of their universe and that what they're creating, the world around them, you know, that, that is, uh, is to do with them. And that then filters out as well. So, you know, if we can do good within this, this universe, then that also other people see that and it affects other people and yeah. I, I love that. Again, going back to accountability, but also that thing that yeah. sometimes we want to save the world, but it's such a big endeavor that <laughs> we never do anything. Yeah. When just by changing ourselves and becoming kinder and more centered, we actually can affect a bigger change. So I love that. And mm -hmm. going from that beautiful 
coming to a question I also ask every person I interview, uh, mm -hmm. because I love to bring that more human side. Sometimes people like you who have these like very like renowned Reiki career for many years, very respected. We see you as like this perfect guru, right? So I love to ask actually one big, you call it whoops, I call it oops, uh, <laughs> that you remember that Mark is one of your biggest learning and it can be anything, just something that actually most people will relate to because we all go through those whoops, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh gosh. Oh. <laughs> I knew you see, I knew you were gonna ask this, and I deliberately didn't think about it. This is very bad. That is All your right. whoops. <laughs> <laughs> That's my whoops. I didn't think about it. Of the whoops. Oh, I mean, I must have. I mean, there's you know, there's so many mistakes that you can make. But I guess um, you know, possibly uh no, I think, you know, everybody has to, I think from a very personal level that we all need to constantly work on ourselves. And um, I think as a teacher, you know, maybe, I can't think of a good whoops for you, but I think, you know, being a better listener is, is definitely something that, you know, I could definitely be. Um, um, not taking things too seriously, that would be a really good thing, you know, so um, when things don't work out how you imagine them, you know, not, you know, being just, just understanding that that's the way things are. You know, I think there's a lot of those just very natural human things that, you know, I wish that I uh, could be better at. And, you know, through my practice, you know, hopefully I, I get better at, but um, any particular experience, the only thing I can just think about right now is that I, I had someone in a class who um, had um, PTSD. And I did actually know that, um, but I didn't ask for details. And I wish I'd known much more about that experience before I went into the class because that person actually had really severe PTSD. So that was a big wow. oops. And yeah, and um, was actually taking medications, had brought I thought it was well it was their partner that they brought with them but the partner was also the carer and you know they never told me any of that but I should have asked so the thing of understanding better um you know what what's going I mean everything was fine and it all worked out in the end but you know I really felt like I had let myself down by not not understanding the situation better and from that then you know obviously having to do more managing in the class than what I probably um, would have had to have done in the first place so you know understanding those things about people and um, yeah maybe that's the you know that's why when I said listening I, I, I love mind. it because it's also very practical but it also has yeah. to do what you're saying like as teachers we're so eager to and here is Reiki blah 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 yeah, like I think, like, and as practitioners too, like this is a Reiki session. Like, I think it's so important to take a step back, especially yeah. with situations like mental illness or PTSD that yeah. can actually be triggered during Reiki. Absolutely, spread words. So that for me is also a big reminder because I'm like, I've never really checked if someone has very strong PTSD, right? Like, so for me, that is actually such a practical thing that we know, like, do we take the moment before we teach to check about this and, and just inform yeah. them they may be triggered, raise your hands, feel free to, to just reach out, right? So I, again, I do feel these oops or whoops are like so rich for us, all of us to learn. So I really appreciate yeah. you sharing that. My pleasure. <laughs> and I have one last question before sharing my drawing, and it's basically yeah. uh, one simple tip, and you've given me already too much, but I'm a greedy person. If I'm like this person who's very lost, and or like I'm stuck for months in the same plateau, and I say, Bronwyn, give me one thing to do or to think that will help me like just transform a little bit my practice. Well, I think that, I think that this relates to what I was saying earlier, but the idea of letting go, yeah? 
so when, especially if we're stuck, right? That's just because we're we're doing this, right? <laughs> that's a good so, one. Yeah. yeah. So you know, I was saying before, like no rules. So you know, really just letting go of you know what you think you should be doing, shouldn't be doing, is, isn't, right, wrong, all the good, bad, right? All these things, just letting that all go and really just sitting in, in, in that space without, yeah? So the more that we can let go, the more we can be this beautiful open space. And when we're in that open space, then everything comes. So I would say, you know, simply, it sounds incredibly simple, but it's something that I think with everything that we need to always be working at is the letting go and the not grasping and holding on. So let go. Yep. I try. I will keep on <laughs> for the rest of my life. But it, 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 because it, again, and what I love is everything is simple, but this one as well, like the let go is probably the hindrance for 95% of us, right? Yeah. The other five are the ones like they know already and they still have to let go, but they, they apply it, right? And they tell us, yeah. let go. And you're like, I'm trying. But yeah. and also like, I love it because let go has many layers, right? At the beginning, we let go of the worry where to place our hands. And yeah. then we let go of the worry about like, is this person feeling a treatment or not? And then we let go of other things, right? Yeah. So I think yeah. it's a beautiful advice for anyone at any stage of, their Reiki practice, even if they've been practicing for 30 years, even let yeah. go of the fact that you think you know things, right? So I, I think it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah. 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 Rowan, thank you so much. So okay. I picture, have... picture. <laughs> <laughs> My God, now I'm like a really stressed. I'm like, what if you don't like it? So I was inspired by. I didn't draw like a lot of animals because my animal drawing skills are really like <laughs> but I, I really was inspired by this fact that you're so connected to nature and animals but also plants and really as you say as equal so basically that's what I drew and I don't know if you can see it. oh my god it's beautiful so oh it's, that is so beautiful so it's basically well, I'm definitely gonna frame that oh thank you so I hope you have a cat because I don't know why I drew a cat. So hopefully you like like one. I've got three cats. Oh, perfect. So it's the three yes. of them. Oh, there is the <laughs> cat. And then obviously the plant. And then I use a lot of gold and silver because it's beautiful. I, it's the moon and the sun. And in Japan, when I went there, like they will always say like non-duality. And I, they didn't even like talk about Reiki practice, but it was everywhere I visited, they will mention. And then that is also sun and the moon for non-duality and just that flowing. Yeah. So that is the drawing and I'll be sending that to you next week. Uh, it will probably take a little bit of time to get all the way there. Uh, but thank you so much. It's the least I can do to thank you for sharing your time and wisdom with us. I really, really appreciate it. And honestly, I love the idea of getting to know you better. I've read your books, I've heard about you, but I've never gotten to spend time with you. So I, I really yeah. heard this occasion. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Have a great- Lovely chatting. Thank you, it was fun. <laughs> Perfect, have a great Friday. I still like, it's night here. So I'm still yeah. like a little geek. <laughs> Bye -bye. See you then.